I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today with Dr. Darren Detweiler. This is the first of three sessions we'll have. My name is Elaine Grant and I'm a quality and food safety specialist here at Perennia. So we'll go over a few housekeeping items. So all participants will have their audio and video turned off during the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. But if you prefer, you can put your question in the chat and I'll catch them there. And we'll go through those questions and answer session at the end of the presentation. Oops, going too fast here. Um, in case you didn't know, Perennia is a provincial development agency with the vision of Nova Scotia as a recognized world leader in producing innovative, environmentally responsible, and safe food of impeccable quality. Our mission is supporting growth, transformation, and economic development in Nova Scotia's agriculture, seafood, and food and beverage sectors. Our service areas are agriculture, quality and food safety, product development, lab services, and fisheries. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Darren Detweiler. He's the founder and CEO of Detweiler Consulting Group. He's internationally recognized and respected food policy expert with over 25 years experience in shaping federal food policy. He's also an assistant dean at Northeastern University's College of Professional Studies and the lead faculty of the Regulatory Affairs and Food Program. He's also the author of two books, Food Safety, Past, Present, and Predictions, and Building the Future of Food Safety Technology. So um, our team actually heard Dr. Detweiler speak in the 2018 SQF International Conference in Georgia that we all attended. Um, we thought the message was just really something Nova Scotia needed to hear, and we're honored to have him speak and share his experiences with us. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So. Dr. Detweiler can share his. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Perinia and everyone who was not only uh, you know critical efforts in putting this uh, event together, but this entire webinar series. I think it's it's uh, even outside of a global pandemic. Uh, there, there's a need for the networking and the the uh, ongoing connections that we have uh, to learn from each other and to support each other. Uh, but but during a period of time where we just don't have the ability to uh, meet up with everyone in person, it's easy to write these events off and saying we can wait for this until next year. But it puts us as a, at a disadvantage in terms of, um, um, again, the, the, the ideas, the thought sharing, the, the leadership, the, the networking, um, even in a virtual platform. So thank you for everyone who put this together and who's participating in th this event or who will be watching a recording of this. Um, you know, food safety is not a, we'll get around to it. Um, quality is not a, we'll get around to it uh, type of an issue. These are things that um, in the industry, we need to focus on 24 uh, seven. And as consumers, we deal with it on a daily basis. So to talk about this right now is, is very timely. Um, and I'm really uh, honored to have been asked to, to, uh, to speak to this audience. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try to share my screen and um, if you. Yep, we can see it. You just need to start it, I guess. There we go. Are we full screen? Full screen, you're ready to go. Excellent. So I'm gonna be talking about the, thank you very much. I'm gonna be talking about the Herculean effort behind food safety. And um, it's, it's not a quick and easy topic to discuss. You know, when we look at the idea of, of where we've been and, and where we are today, um, uh, you know, as was mentioned, I wrote a book called Food Safety Past, Present and Predictions. Um, you know, we need to understand that, you know, down in the United States, we typically look at this current era of food safety, this current culture of food safety, as being uh, triggered by the 1993 Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak. But along the line, along the, the years, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, 27 years plus since, um, we've seen leafy greens of concern. Uh, we know about the maple leaf uh, uh, outbreak in Canada. We know about DeCoster's eggs and the massive recall. We know about the Peanut Corporation of America, that outbreak and that's, uh, that, that earthquake of a court decision uh, that, that sent executives to federal prison for 20, 20, 28 years. 
we know about blue ball ice cream and about uh, Chipotle. These are the two largest with Chipotle being the largest uh, amount uh, of uh, a fine being paid uh, related to food safety and Blue Bell, uh, the second largest amount. And those, those um, decisions were within a, a, a week of each other here just this year. Uh, and that those outbreaks were significant in terms of their economic impact uh, for those companies and their employees. We also know about Jensen uh, Farms Cantaloupe um, and how some of these had an, an interesting play. Uh, how did one impact the other? Uh, and then finally, even this year, looking at leafy greens again uh, and how for the last three years, leafy greens has been an issue in terms of, of uh, outbreak and, and recall concerns. I'm going to touch a little bit on some of these as we go along, uh, but, but clearly um, during these last 27 years and beyond, um, we, we've seen that, that the, the world of concern in terms of food safety and quality has moved beyond just simply uh, uh, meat and produce. Um, you know, we, we look at ready to eat goods, we look at commercially packaged goods, we look at uh, uh, products that have ingredients that are sourced from around the world. We also look at how our distribution of food has radically changed. It's no longer simply uh, going to your local grocery store or going to a restaurant. We order things on apps. We have things delivered or even go to trucks to get food delivered. And we even order, um, some of us order um, you know, partially packaged foods that we will then uh, prepare in our own homes. So the, not only the, the, the way foods and where food comes from, but how we end up um, um, as consumers engaging with that transaction and, and um, uh, getting our hands on eating food has changed um, over time here. You know, some things that haven't changed though are the questions we ask. Um, um, we, we continue to ask questions, but the nature of the questions themselves has changed. And, you know, the initial question we used to ask about food is, can I afford it? Is it the taste I want? And is it enough? Today, however, the questions we ask are a little bit more about food reputation. We look at food quality, food safety, food defense, food security, and even issues of food authenticity and fraud. I'd like to explain this a little bit more. Um, while, while food quality could be, you know, look, taste, smell, even the, con the, the condition of the store or place we buy it from, food safety has taken on so many different levels. Um, uh, um, and food defense, it's, it's scary to think that we have to talk about food defense, uh, but we do see these pop up. Food security, uh, especially during um, these times, has become an issue. And food fraud, we find examples of all these um, uh, concerns in, in the news. But let's get down to really kind of defining these more specifically. With, with food quality, again, we're talking about taste, smell, appearance, touch. It's not necessarily a food safety issue, um, but it, it could be tied to it. Uh, whereas food safety, now we're talking about biological contamination, chemical contamination, and physical contamination. So a food could be recalled because it has metal or plastic or, or rocks or glass in it. Um, chemical contamination is when we talk, for instance, about, let's talk about certain allergens or literal chemicals. Um, and biological, this is your E. coli, salmonella, your foodborne pathogens. Um, Food defense, as I kind of hinted with the picture there, this is everything from terrorism to industrial sabotage and economically motivated adulteration. And it's scary to think that um, while many people think that these don't take place, there are uh, clear cut evidence of, of um, uh, economically motivated adulteration and terrorism and sabotage that take place within the food industry, even within recent years. Food security, here we're talking about availability, access, utilization, and stability. Whereas food fraud in the bigger definition of things, here we have adulteration, tampering, overrun and diversion, simulation, counterfeiting, and theft. Now again, it would be very easy for me to say that a food issue is an incident, a crisis if you will, is one of these five categories. 
But in reality, you can have a food defense issue that is also a food safety issue. Or you can even have a food fraud issue that happens to also be a food safety issue. If there is an incidence with food fraud, food theft, et cetera, that involves someone's safety, it harms a consumer, it can be more than one of these categories. Um, imagine um, a, a counterfeiting or, or intentional mislabeling of food that does not include um, identified allergens and someone becomes harmed from that. Um, so th there's some things to consider there. But let's take it to the next level and look at the idea of a crisis, an incident, right? So when we have uh, this idea, of, I'm gonna put this into the perspective of a life cycle of a policy issue. Um, we have an incident and if we have enough incidents, uh, we have a crisis. And one could say, well, this can uh, capture or be thrust into the arena of public attention and we can look at this over time. What does a crisis look like? A crisis, uh, we could easily put some faces on this, um, but I don't think I wanna do this just yet. Let, let's look at the timeline before we get to the kind of more personal side of things. So the red curve you see here uh, that, that's going up is the idea of, of when companies uh, will decide to take action um, you know, they will do, they will stop doing something, they will recall something, they will initiate a new protocol, uh, whatever it is, they take some action. In some cases, it's done early by those who, uh, who take action in relation to stakeholder expectations. Others may require there to be political developments, um, uh, elected officials uh, inquiring, having a hearing, uh, investigating, looking into something. Um, but it's important to look at the fact that, that while there could be people who wait to different periods of time along this monitoring or hindsight after an, an incident uh, stage, down below there are two curves, options and liabilities. Over time, the longer that it takes for a food company to react, to change, to do something different, to stop an outbreak, if you will, options decrease. Whereas at the same time, as the length of time increases, liabilities will tend to increase. More people become harmed, more distribution has taken place, uh, more sales, more serving, um, more people have this, uh, if not in their house, actually on their plate. So when we look at the idea of later in the game, this is when more companies um, have, have decided to wait until later after an event takes place, after an incident, a crisis takes place to make certain change. In many cases, it's due to changes in legislation or litigation. It could be due to court cases, for instance, like some of those cases I saw. Now, some people might point out the jack in the box, there was no court case. I think that's significant because the lack of a uh, court case in this, situ in the, in this specific incident um, was what allowed some companies to believe that they won't be held accountable for it. But when you start looking at the legislative and the, the, the court's intervention, whether it be Jensen Farms, where we had um, the owners uh, held responsible. Uh, we had Maple Leaf, the actions that were taken in response to that. DeCosters involved uh, three months of jail time. Peanut Corporation of America involved the largest amount of jail time. Uh, and then, like I mentioned before, Blue Bell Ice Cream at Chipotle, such a large uh, uh, fines being levied by the Department of Justice. This is the kind of uh, information that companies are looking at now in terms of we have to do something, if not about um, legislation and litigation that specifically is directed at us, it could be, look what's already happened in the industry. Of course, some other companies will make those change only after there is, uh, um, during the resolution stage, a, res a regulation or oversight change, such as uh, new regulatory schemes, uh, new powers given to um, uh, agriculture authorities. So again, this, this is how we kind of look at things over time. 
Um, but there's a new curve. A note that the red curve is the more traditional. You kind of see it sloping up and then uh, curving down. But let's look at the more current curve that we're seeing today. Here, um, um, we see the role that social media is starting to play in this in terms of shaping stakeholder expectations. We see how even a Department of Health sending out through, through Twitter, through various social media platforms, information directly to consumers, not relying on consumers to get information directly from the company or from the industry or from, let's say, the, the local or federal government, but sending out information directly to consumers. Even the idea of, of uh, memes and political cartoons. If you did not hear the news, read the news, watch the news, whatever about Chipotle and their E. coli outbreak, you might have become aware of it, of it through social media, memes. Uh, same thing with Bluebell ice cream. Look at that uh, luscious listeria. The idea of it gaining so much attention that um, in, in certain newspapers uh, and, and certain media outlets, you can find these political cartoons. And I don't know if you can see this, but on the bottom uh, right of the political cartoon, you see it go. It went from the the, the, the farm girl, let's say, uh, carrying her bucket and milking the cow to her being sick and using the bucket in a different way. This sends messages to, for, via social media to stakeholders and it's really expanding the role of the stakeholder to be that of simply beyond just, you either were a stockholder, you own stock in the company, and now you have a say, Stakeholders and is now including consumers. Um, uh, their awareness is critical in this arena. Um, but there's another change I want to talk about within this life cycle of policy issue. Notice that everything we're talking about here has been uh, after that public attention uh, has been gained through an incident or crisis. The approaches that we look at in terms of food safety do not need to all be reactive. You know, we, we, we see how Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we, we see how technology is being used in terms of food safety management and business intelligence and food standards. But, but the role that it's playing more and more in terms of trace, uh, traceability and transparency needs to be thought of throughout the industry, uh, throughout the entire supply chain, supply chain, in terms of how it can also be proactive. Let's take a look at that proactive stance here. So you see pretty much the same curve we've been looking at before, but if we continue way to the left, if we look at the idea of predictive analytics stages, when we can find evidence and issues that would raise concerns before a product is consumed, before it is entered into the market, entered into commerce, before there are incidents and crisis involving uh, harm or worse to consumers, what if we're able to insert certain controls? Notice that we're talking about a time before, again, if it's before it enters the, the, the market, if you will, uh, be, before we actually start increasing our number of liabilities. But what we've also done is we've expanded our options. We've increased our options such that we now are, are dealing with two areas of concern. One is that we now increase the value of the technology and of those uh, mitigation activities and those who are involved in uh, the, the predictive analytics and control phase. Um, the, 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 the value of those options increase significantly. But I cannot be ignorant or, or obtuse in terms of the fact that this does raise a level of complexity. However, I, I believe that the value that's added, even in the face of the complexity in terms of increasing the options for control in a predictive element is a better option than simply trying to be operating reactively after the fact. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about technology. I've heard of blockchain being described as a golden ticket. Uh, and, and with with this, you know, we, we have this world of big data, if you will. 
And that's fine. Working with this is fine. But the reality is, is that big data means nothing unless we can transform big data into actionable information. And perhaps the best way to transform big data into actionable information is through human literacy. So human literacy is this third leg, if you will. We can talk about data literacy and we can talk about technological literacy, but you can have all the data in the world and not know what to do with it. You can have all the means to do things with this data that still doesn't translate into what, what do we do with this data? How do we prioritize? How do we decide to invest? How do we make sure we're aligned with our mission statement? How do we, um, how, how do we train um, everyone from the, 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 you know, the newly hired person who works on the, the, the production floor to our executive suite? And this comes at a time when we also have to take into consideration that these various responsibilities um, are, are radically categorized in terms of corporate social responsibility. We have economic responsibilities. We have legal responsibilities. Uh, by we, I mean a firm. A firm has economic responsibilities, legal responsibilities, ethical responsibilities, and, and perhaps even philanthropic responsibilities. We know that there are firms that can take care of their economic responsibilities and be breaking the law. Or they can even be following the law, but finding loopholes to be able to take advantage of their economic responsibilities. But even taking advantage or, or taking the responsibilities associated with, with economic and legal responsibilities does not necessarily mean that the best ethical considerations are put into place. And we have to package that uh, in consideration of, of the, the human needs. We can look at Maslow's hierarchy of human needs in terms of our physiological needs have to be met first. If we are suffering because of a lack of air, shelter, water, food, sleep, or those survival skills, we as consumers and even our employees who work in the food industry cannot start processing or, or serving their higher needs. Next up, we have personal and financial security and safety. This is health and well being. Then we have social needs, friendship and family, esteem, and finally, self actualization. You're not going to be worried about your social needs if you can't breathe or you haven't eaten for a while, or if you are worried about your, your, your health and well-being. Um, again, this is not just the consumer. This is also the people that, that, that are working for us. Uh, you know, all of a sudden in the States, we heard this idea of food workers being reclassified as essential employees or essential workers. That's nice. And, oops, I went too far. Uh, that's nice and all, but but you know if if we can't make sure that that their needs are taken um, that, that their human needs are are taken care of, how can we expect them to take care of the regulatory compliance needs on the job? Some things to consider there when you start looking at how most people assume that the most basic bottom rung needs of humans are dealt with by the top level responsibilities on the corporate end of it. So we have to think about how do our actions, how do we train, how do we prioritize and invest into making sure that our, our consumers, our workforce, their human needs are taken care of within these responsibilities. And of course, one of the things that, that is looked at most is the idea of um, how these policy issues end up impacting positively or negatively, consumers trust in a brand. Um, when, when there's an incident, when there's an outbreak, when there's a recall, this is going to inevitably impact consumers' trust in that company, in that brand, in that label, uh, or perhaps in that chain, in that, that grocery store, that restaurant, whatever. Um, you have a breakdown in trust that takes place. So there, there's a lot to be served by considering whether it's the trust of your consumers or the needs of your consumers in terms of, of the responsibilities that are taken uh, within the realm of food safety and quality. 
and I, I talk about this all within food. This this can be seen with other industries as well, but but it's obvious to I'm sure everyone on this call that food is an essential part of our rites of passage. Um, you know that idea of 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 um, um, you know sending your children to school and and do you send lunch with them or do they eat lunch there at the school? Do they buy the school? Um, Growing up and you start uh, as a teenager, perhaps cooking on your own, maybe you get a car and you start, uh, you know, eating away from home um, with your friends, shopping for yourselves, you know, going to the grocery store for yourselves. Um, uh, also coming of age, that idea of first jobs, how many people in North America, their first jobs are one way, shape or form tied to the food industry, uh, anywhere on the, the spectrum of the supply chain, uh, you know, retail and restaurant or even um, other places. Um, and finally, you know, getting married and raising children, that idea of the, the, the responsibility that we take in the food that we prepare for them and, and serve for them. And then the cycle starts over again. Now that idea of um, the idea of uh, the fear of sending our children out uh, to to eat at school, perhaps, for many people, this is much more of a concern than others. Some people look at um, the idea, oh, oh, I'm healthy, I eat a lot of bad food, or, um, you know, it was a stomach flu, a stomach bug, I got over it right away. But there are other people in our society that are more vulnerable, the most vulnerable when it comes to foodborne pathogens and allergens are, are very young. Those with compromised immune system, it could be through cancer treatment or a surgery or an existing illness or perhaps COVID-19. Those who are pregnant and those who are elderly. These are the ones who are most likely to become hospitalized or die from the very thing that, that, that a quote unquote healthy adult would just pass off as a nuisance. We also have to understand that when we talk about it in terms of foodborne illness, it's not that eating the food is the only way to become sick from it. You can become sick by a foodborne pathogen from person-to-person -person contact with someone who is sick but is not washing their hands. I talk with doctors who in some areas say that the most cases of E. coli that they see on an annual basis is actually from people who get some sick from E. coli uh, at a water park, uh, a public pool, or, or some recreational facility. There's also animal contact. Uh, there's been numerous cases uh, where people have become sick from uh, petting zoos or, or, or a county fair or something along that line. Uh, and then we have, in some cases, the idea of even airborne, like with norovirus. So we can't look at all consumers as being the same level of, of vulnerability, and we can't look at all foodborne pathogens equally in terms of, of you either eat it or you don't. There are multiple vulnerable populations that deal with those threats from multiple ways of becoming sick from a foodborne pathogen. Now, I mentioned earlier the idea of, of in a crisis, um, th there is a personal side to this, and perhaps this idea of human intelligence has us needing to understand the true burden of disease. And one of the, one of the um, aspects of my career has been meeting up with families and talking with them over time about how they were involved in terms of uh, becoming a victim of, of a food uh, pathogen issue. There's some people that I've represented here who've literally asked me to share their, their family story. Uh, one here is, is Serena. Serena uh, and her family in the Portland, Oregon area. In 2014, um, she was um, uh, misdiagnosed with hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, basically at four years of age, she was dealing with renal failure and uh, her father took her to see the doctor at a local clinic. And along the way on his phone, called his brother, described some symptoms. The brother said, you need to ask the doctor to test free E. coli. And the father did ask the doctor to, ask, to test free E. coli, but the doctor did not think that it was possible for her to be sick for E. coli. What were the chances of it? 
and did not do this and said, you need to follow up with your regular pediatrician within a week if symptoms still continue. Ultimately, within two days of seeing the doctor, this young girl had died from renal failure. Um, and this misdiagnosis, um, we, we never found out the source. We, 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 we believe it might've been person to person transmission B. coli. Um, but, but one thing that stood out from this is that um, this being misdiagnosed by the doctor, um, the investigators went and looked at the doctor's notes and found on the side that the word E. coli in a question mark was written in the margin, even though they never followed up with this. Um, this involved in some policy change efforts and, in Oregon State in terms of mandatory testing for foodborne illness when obvious symptoms are, prevent, are presented. Um, in Washington State, literally just under the Canadian border, uh, that, that far north within Washington State, I also talked with a family of uh, young Brooklyn. They're a family of ranchers. Um, that they had been a family of ranchers for generations. The same period of time here, uh, this, this young girl died at three and a half years of age from E. coli. They never found out what the source was. Uh, it was a small outbreak that was complicated with two other illnesses in the, re in the region, namely the first person I showed you, uh, but they were determined to be not related. And I'll never forget uh, the conversation I had with her father, again, a rancher, who said not only did her death destroy their family and it destroyed their way of life, this is a father who said he didn't know how to continue being a father to their surviving two-year-old daughter. And um, when, when he was unable to uh, protect the, the, the older daughter, Brooklyn here, he also talked about how it was very difficult for him to deal with these issues. He couldn't talk about it with his family. He couldn't talk about it at work. He couldn't talk about it with his friends. And uh, I think the saddest thing that he told me, this, this, this incident took place during the late summer, early spring. He said that he was invited to his aunt's house for Thanksgiving that year, uh, which was a common uh, event, common uh, uh, act, family activity. Um, but the aunt said that, um, they were hoping the family would not mention their daughter or their daughter's death because that would be a real downer for that family gathering and how much that impacted um, him and his family that um, it would be treated that way only a few short months after the death of his daughter. I could go on and talk about Michael. Uh, Michael was um, uh, died uh, premature birth um, in 2004 in New York State. The mother um, was a nurse who decided to be healthy during her pregnancy and, and ate mostly salads. She got sick with listeria through the, the lettuce there. Um, the, the mother uh, twice confided in me about how she lives with the fact that her body recovered quickly, her heart slowly, and that she lives with wisdom that she wished she never had. The family of, of Joshua um, here, th this one was a little bit different. In 2014 in Massachusetts, uh, Joshua at eight years of age died from E. coli and E2S renal failure. Um, it wasn't misdiagnosed. It, it, it wasn't uh, due to failure of, of medical attention, um, but it had to do with the fact that um, his family bought a package of ground beef from a well-known uh, grocery store chain in the US. Um, but the, the, the investigators found that the grocery store chain had been notified of a recall of, of this contaminated meat from a lot. And they decided that they didn't have enough information to make the determination that they actually needed to follow the government's request. Um, after the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service gave them a notice to please recall this product with this serial number, this lot, this range, whatever it was from your shelves. They continued to sell that product for some 50 days. The State Department of Health Epidemiologists ultimately saying that this company dragged their feet in an attempt to avoid doing a recall that ultimately resulted in the death of a young individual in here. Uh, Christopher and his family, I've known them for several years in 2008, um, they, 
they, they dealt with the fact that their seven-year-old son, Christopher, got sick from salmonella due to peanuts from the Peanut Corporation of America outbreak. Um, it's pretty sad when a seven-year-old boy looks at his parents in the face and says that he hurts so bad that he wants to die. I met with Arlene, who at 63 years of age uh, in 2008 got sick from salmonella tied to eggs. And she said, it's, it's crazy to think that she beat breast cancer and that it was easier to deal with that surgery and treatment uh, than it was you know, comparing it to the lingering colon problems from her salmonella issue or illness. Uh, she was a professional dancer and dance teacher uh, be, be, before this, and at 63 years of age, not only had to deal with this illness, um, uh, but, but also had to essentially stop becoming a dancer. I also met with the, the mother of Sydney and Cole, these siblings in 2014, um, uh, two of, of a set of triplets, they got sick uh, with salmonella from what's called veggie booty, uh, a, a product, a, a veggie snack that comes from a Chinese supplier. Um, and um, the mother described how for days, her daughter would just grab them and scream and cry and jerk. Um, 1997, Libby got sick with, uh, with E. coli from undercooked hamburger, was hospitalized for two weeks. And she's considered to be you know, a survivor. Her family considers himself to be uh, very fortunate that she survived. And the industry will, of course, say, hey, it's glad she survived. But the reality is that the doctors didn't even know what to do. And when the mother describes the situation, saying that she went through IVs, barium enemas, morphine, but no stool or urine samples were taken for days, that the mom cried, please help me, and the nurses were staring at them, that she was the, the daughter, the, set, the five year old girl was literally standing there in a room at the hospital, standing there, and everyone was staring at them, no one offered them help. And uh, the, the daughter was crying. And at some point, even the doctor started crying, saying they did not know why she was hurting. It is a really scary scenario to be going through this, um, even for those who quote unquote survive. Um, you know, there's a big difference between these personal conversations and the information that I get from them as opposed to what we see in terms of media coverage. In my book, Food Safety, Past, Present Predictions, I look at how the 1993 Jack in the Box E. coli outbreak, looking at the headlines, the keywords and headlines from the major national newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times that were covering that outbreak in 1993 had one set of words. But I look at the same exact period of time, the same event, and headlines from local newspapers, the Seattle Times, the Seattle Post Intelligencer, the Bellingham Herald, these newspapers that were covering the story uh, where so many of the uh, 700 uh, so illnesses and the majority of the deaths of the four children who died during that period of time were taking place in the greater Seattle, Washington area. You start to see a different picture. The national papers were talking more about it in terms of the company, in terms of the product, in terms of the industry, uh, whereas the local papers were starting to talk about community, about victim, about parents and families. Uh, it literally, only the local papers mentioned the word E. coli. And yes, the local papers were by far, uh, even including the names of, of those who were sick, including my son Riley, who in 1993 not only got sick, not from eating the product, but from coming in contact with another child at his daycare who had become sick with E. coli from eating the product. But my son Riley became the fourth individual to die, the fourth and last victim of this outbreak at 17 months old, uh, dying from respiratory failure, renal failure, and hemolytic uremic syndrome from a person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. Data aside, um, 
it, it's hard to, to talk about data, to talk about statistics, to talk about bars and graphs, and not understand the true burden of disease, what it looks like. You know, when I held my son in his, literally his, his hospital bed there, and he was saying Baba because he didn't understand that the IV bottle hanging on a pole was not a bottle. And that those ended up being the last words I ever heard him say. To see your son being airlifted, um, put on a helicopter and taken to Children's Hospital, to then look at your son and, and have to search for uh, anything that looks like your son because he's dwarfed by wires and tubes and monitors. And to finally see your son again outside the hospital being carried in the world's smallest white coffin is quite a shock in terms of literally learning about what E. coli is. This is not the memories of a child. This is not the experiences of a parent that anyone wants or looks forward to. And this was a big shock in terms of how the, the public was learning about food safety, how consumers were learning about this. Um, the New York Times, I published an article um, um, with about a year after my son's hospitalization um, that looked at the idea of, of a tragedy and how I had been working with a TV network in terms of uh, a, st a studio, in terms of a, a, a TV movie about the incident, but they literally said that there wasn't enough sex and violence to sell this to the public, that the tragedy wasn't enough. The irony is that the New York Times published this. The New York Times was the first major national newspaper to actually name a victim and talk about the impact on a victim, um, uh, again, uh, on a national level, uh, whereas the predominant focus of uh, on community, uh, on family, on victims had only been seen at the local levels before this. A lot has changed since then. Um, this year I did a, a TED talk, a TEDx presentation on the idea of, of, of um, how my focus on food safety has changed over 28 years and how focusing solely on the past is no longer healthy or sustainable uh, to me. And what I kind of talked about was the idea that we know from 1906 that the things described by Mr. Sinclair, this is a, from a literary review of Upton Sinclair's 1906 book, The Jungle. This is from the London Daily Times. The things described by Mr. Sinclair happened yesterday are happening today and will happen tomorrow and the next day until some Hercules comes to cleanse the filthy stable. We know that there is no such thing as a Hercules, but perhaps what we're really talking about here is the Herculean effort behind food safety. And before I define that, um, I, I, I wanna talk about something that was shown to me a few years back. A family I had met when, a four-year-old boy had become ill from E. coli, I had an opportunity to revisit the family years later. And the mother handed me this picture to show me that she, she saw her son drawing this picture and asked him what it was about. And the son said, um, well, I, I hate the fact that I can't I'm not like the other boys in the playground. He had a stroke, he was, do, he was under dialysis. Even though he recovered, he had a stroke and he lost the ability to use his right arm. And he said he wished he was able to play like the other kids in the, in the school playground. But he also said that he wished that someone uh, had, someone who worked in the food industry had said something or done something that could have prevent him from being sick and, and having this complication with his arm. And he drew a picture of this person who worked in the work in the, in the food industry who could have made that impact. He didn't draw a smock or a, a, a white coat or a hairnet or a badge or a suit. He literally drew someone uh, flying with a cape, like a superhero. And I've shown this to my audiences to point out that um, they might not wear a cape in the job that they do in, in the food industry, but the fact that our food safety requires a Herculean effort, an enormous amount of work and strength and courage. And for the large number of us that do day in and day out, put in that large amount of work, strength and courage to protect consumers, even those who we'll never meet. 
um, that, that it is they who are perceived by some as being, even in this world of Marvel and DC superhero movies, uh, the same level, the, they, that they are heroes and that the work that they do really does matter. And uh, for me, sharing this message has not only been a way for me to contribute back to the industry, but it also provides an opportunity for what I hold as um, living up to this notion that yes, I lost my son. That is a fact I live with, but I cannot live with the fact that if I don't continue this message, if I don't help others, if I don't inspire others and thank them for their Herculean efforts, that I could look at it in terms of my son lost his father. I don't want anyone to ever say that my son lost his father. These are opportunities for me to keep his memory alive and perhaps provide for his legacy and hoping that others, if they don't learn about this, at least the work that they do is supported and we can help build the right work in terms of, of the, the mission and the investment and the training and the overall Herculean effort that we need in today's very complex uh, food supply chain. And with that, I thank you very, very much. And I am happy to answer questions with the time we have remaining. Oh, thanks, Dr. Detweiler. I do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, and in, it's really in the theme of being proactive instead of reactive. So what is the first step that one thing that food producers or processors can do to ensure they're producing a safe product for their customers? Well, I would think that one step could be seen as, as training, but I, I, I think that in terms of actual execution, we need to look at the idea of independent um, auditing, independent third party uh, testing and sampling, that idea of, of um, you know, really trusting that are you sampling for the right um, uh, items? Are you, are you looking in the right places? Are you continuously waiting and being proactive in terms of your testing and looking at, you know, is your, is your, um, is your x-ray machine uh, truly doing its job? Are your protocols truly producing the right temperatures or the right, um, whatever it is that, that, that they're designed to do? Don't wait until you have an incident to go check and see if you need to recalibrate that. This is something that there should be ongoing clear set expectations, validating that those expectations are the right, um, are the right ones, uh, that they are going to produce the right work. And don't just assume that they're working, get independent people to test that. And even with your protocols, um, have mock recall, have mock spills, have mock incidents where you can test to see if your, uh, if, you know, if your quality assurance or if your workforce, your sanitation team, whatever it is, uh, will, will perform uh, when tested within the expectations uh, rather than waiting until there's an incident to see if that happens. Because again, that proactive element uh, uh, of, of knowing before it becomes an issue is going to help you not only, you know, redesign, restructure, um, revise your protocols, revise your testing protocols, revise your, your strategies, um, but also hopefully, um, you know, ultimately refine them such that you can minimize these events happening in the first place. Sounds good. That's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly what we've been trying to tell our clients as well. So it's, it's nice to have that reaffirmed. So as a consultant, what do you commonly see as industry strengths and where can we improve? I see a growing strength in terms of the training and the partnerships that are going on. I see companies that um, they'll have training events and they will literally bring someone from every single different division, literally from, from shipping and receiving, from the security guard at the gate to uh, you know, maintenance and uh, engineering uh, into these, uh, these, these training sessions and make sure that every division, every department uh, is aware of this and take input from them, whether it be food security, even food, um, I'm sorry, whether it be food safety or even food security issues. Uh, one of the most um, heartwarming, I guess, uh, uh, stories I got was there was an audit. Uh, the inspector found a little like hole about four to six inches above the floor in a freezer unit 
asked about it and found out that um, the forklifts were working within this area where they were slipping a little bit and that a, a, a one of the, 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 the blades went into the wall there. And the um, you know, ultimate supervisor said, well, let's get ourselves some, some uh, non-slip wheels. Uh, and yet we can do that, you know, spare no expense. And the best in the market happens to be one that uses walnut shells as the grit within the rubber to make sure that there's non-slip. And um, the supervisor said, let's buy those. And the head of the engineering department said, no, we cannot buy those. The reason being is the head of the engineering had been in the training dealing with food allergens and realized that technically this would invalidate their ability to claim that the food was produced in an allergen free uh, um, uh, facility in terms of, of peanuts because there were walnut shells being used in the, the the wheels there and if they had just blindly purchased those without consulting you know why do we need to talk to engineering folks that maintain our equipment kind of a thing um, they, they would have gone down a, a bad path so the fact that people are 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 doing that kind of work is is encouraging the fact that there are companies I consult with that fly in representatives from the companies from their distribution and even where they source their ingredients to make sure that they are aligned with the company's mission is also very, um, very uh, awesome to hear. So I think that it's not just that there's training going on, that there's more training on going on, or that there's better training going on, but that the, the audience for companies have continued to increase uh, to, to make sure that more stakeholders within the um, what goes behind the trust of that label are included in those training efforts, even though this starts to increase the expense of that training efforts. Um, I, I'm glad to see that. That's good. Um, yeah, and we, and we see that too, like a few companies are starting to bring in other and that's how you catch those things, right? So that's why that's so important. They're trying to bring in everybody from all walks of life and everybody involved in the plant and those decisions. That was a really good catch. Um, any advice for food safety professionals that are listening and are wanting to inspire or strengthen their food safety culture at their facility? What is that one message that production workers and managers really need to hear to drive this home? I'm really encouraged when people you know, it's, it's one thing to look at facts. Facts are very important. Science and facts are very important. But facts and science, data, graph charts, that kind of stuff, that only goes so far in terms of, of motivating the participation and the, the uh, plucking the heartstrings, if you will, uh, of those in your audience. You need to include an element of this idea of the true burden of disease. What does, don't just talk about numbers for E. coli or salmonella. What does it mean to become sick from salmonella, E. coli, et cetera? And not just going, oh, some people just, uh, you know, have diarrhea for a week or it could be vomiting or some people could go to the hospital. I think people need to know that those vulnerable populations who may be members of the family you know, the very young, the elderly, those who are pregnant, those with compromised immune systems, those, could, could, those members of your audience can find examples of those in their home, in their family, in their, their community, and start to realize what it means to be a victim and what those victims look like. Look at those ideas of, of like I've done here, um, sharing some of these stories. Uh, and it's not about a scare factor. It's not about, um, you know, um, traumatizing someone, but I work with audiences, sometimes people who've worked 10, 15, 20 years in the industry who said, I've never actually talked to anyone who became sick, who was impacted by this. Um, this one company I work with, they, uh, they had a, a young consumer uh, get sick from uh, an allergen. And uh, even though the food was supposed to be produced, there was a mixed messages or mislabeling or something had happened. And this girl got very, very sick from it. And this family volunteered to work with the company and they literally brought the mother and the daughter who got sick uh, in to talk with those employees to share her experience. What does it mean to get sick? What's it look like? What did it feel like? What happened? And this made a big difference in terms of that, that I know what to do, 
but now I know why to do it and why uh, I need to make sure that this new person knows how to do it and why to do it. Because it's not just about, well, that slows us down or that may cost us. It's like, this is how people how, are, are really impacted. So bringing, sure, bringing that message of true burden of disease, putting a face behind numbers, sharing stories, and including your consumers as stakeholders in the bigger training events is always a good way of trying to reach out to those people who um, might not necessarily get the message. That leads perfectly into actually a comment we received that I'd like to read out to you. Um, thank you for a very informative and engaging webinar. As a father of two young children, your personal experience has moved me deeply and has really hit home. This brings it all in perspective about why we do what we do. And I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you once again. This is exactly after we've, we all sat down and, and attended the SQF conference, why we really felt that Nova Scotians needed to hear this and your message. And it, it definitely holds strong for sure. Um, I can't thank you enough for a, helping, helping us bring this message to the Maritimers. Well, thank you. And you're very welcome for this. You know, it's, it's um, again, it, it's one thing to try to be one person who makes these changes. It's another thing to have that multiplication factor in terms of trying to help others and trying to inspire others uh, to, to, to make these changes. Uh, clearly, uh, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Back in 1993, I thought this was something that would go away. You know, the government would fix it. Scientists would fix this. Fix this. Uh, industry would figure this out, kind of a thing. And um, I've lived more than half my life now observing the seemingly endless cycle of of failure and and interaction and reform. And we'll never have a time where there's you know there's no bacteria. There will never be. Um, a day where there's no foodborne pathogens. But what there can be is a period of time where we think about it differently, we act more proactively, uh, we train better, we, we, we have a better understanding, and uh, ultimately we can try to mitigate and prevent as many of these failures as we can. And when there are failures, we can react to them as fast as we can and as well equipped and as well intentioned as we can. Well, I want to thank you again for, for joining us and as well as all the attendees for joining us as well. So please join us on January 19th for our second session, which is Building the Future of Food Safety Technology, which all these webinar sessions are made possible by our Agri-Food Accelerator Program. So we can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. And uh, we wish you a happy holidays and stay safe and stay well. Thank you, everyone.